Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a conversation with Katie Hobbs, a Democratic candidate for governor of Arizona. That's next on Arizona Horizon. This hour of local news is made possible by contributions from the friends of PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this election 2022 edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight, a discussion with one of the candidates running for governor of Arizona. Joining us is Secretary of State Katie Hobbs, who is a Democratic candidate for governor. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. Uh, first question has to be, why are we doing this? Why are we not doing a debate? Well, you know, I've said from the beginning that I want to be able to have a substantive conversation about the issues that Arizonans are facing that I'm talking to them every day about on the campaign trail. And I think this is a great opportunity to do that, to make my case directly to the voters of um, how I'm hearing the issues and the plans we have to bring people together to solve these challenges. And I think that uh, my opponent's activities over the last week since this interview was announced really underscore uh, my case that she's only interested in a spotlight. She threw a tantrum outside of this building about this very interview. And that tantrum led to people in this building getting harassing and threatening phone calls and racist attacks. And that kind of behavior is the behavior of a high school bully. It's not the behavior of a leader. It's not the behavior of someone who deserves our vote for governor. And it shows that she doesn't have the temperament to lead. And so for me, this debate about debates is over. I am looking forward to not only this conversation, but I've been making the case to voters with reporters uh, in different forums where um, there's the opportunity for a very in-depth dialogue about the issues. Uh, but standing up to your opponent is, is one aspect of leadership. And you didn't debate in the primary either against Marco Lopez. And I don't think he would have made a spectacle as, as you suggested Carrie Lake, Carrie Lake might have. Why no debates this go around? You know, I was focused in the primary on what we needed to do the gen to do to win this election in November. And uh, the voters overwhelmingly chose me in that race. And I think that shows that, you know, the debate wasn't an issue there. And I think right now it's a distraction. I think Carrie Lake is so desperate for a debate because she is scared to sit down and have an in-depth conversation because it will highlight her level of inexperience, the lack of qualification to be governor. So for those who are concerned, they want to see more fight from you mm -hmm. as far as debating is concerned, just in general, what do you tell them? I am fighting every day to win this election, uh, to fight to protect our freedoms in Arizona. We have built a campaign to win, and I'm out there fighting every single day, and that's what I'll do as governor. Um, and we want to get to some issues here in a second, but your opponent, and one of the reasons she thinks that you don't want to debate, because you don't want to hear her bring up the issue, and we've seen billboards around town, mm -hmm. for goodness sakes, that you are a twice convicted racist uh, regarding the discrimination claims by a former Senate staffer. What happened with that incident? Because you have actually apologized. Uh, you mm -hmm. said your response in this incident fell short of taking real responsibility and that you failed to meet the moment. Address this issue, please. Yeah. Well, I'll just say that that Carrie Lake's attacks about this are, are, are baseless and uh, have, have risen to the level of personal attacks, and I'm not going to respond to her personal attacks. I am truly sorry, as I've said many times, for the real harm that I know Ms. Adams faced as a result of that situation. And I've taken accountability for my role in her termination. And looking forward, I've continued to meet with community leaders uh, and focus on how we can not just build a campaign that's inclusive, but uh, make sure that our, that our government uh, at every level of the administration reflects the diversity of the state of Arizona and that we are making sure that it's accountable and works for everyone. But when you said that, you know, you failed to meet the moment at the time, that was a quote from you. Um, why shouldn't voters be concerned about that coming from someone who wants to be the chief executive of the state? Uh, when that verdict was announced, I was admittedly very defensive. And I think that Arizonans deserve a leader who is willing to own up to their mistakes and move forward from that. I've learned from that, and I will continue to learn. Um, let's get to some issues here. Inflation, the number one, uh, Phoenix mm -hmm. is the number one 
oh my goodness, we're number one as yes. far as inflation rates of large metropolitan areas mm -hmm. in the country. Why is that? Well, our inflation here in Arizona is being largely driven by housing prices. Uh, we are seeing skyrocketing rents. It's very difficult for someone to get into first-time home ownership, uh, and uh, and we're seeing. I'm hearing that from folks all over. Uh, we have a comprehensive plan to address affordability in Arizona. Uh, in terms of housing, we need to build more. We're not meeting the demand, and so prices are continuing to stay high. Uh, but you know, I I raised my kids here in Phoenix uh, with financial ups and downs. I know what it's like to have to get a second job to put food on the table and pay your mortgage. And so my affordable Arizona plan uh, addresses struggles that Arizonans are facing right now. Uh, we propose uh, tax breaks on everyday items like over-the-counter medication and diapers. Uh, we put people back to work by uh, expanding child care assistance and a refundable tax credit for pursuing career and technical education. Uh, I know what it's like to struggle, and I'm never going to forget that as governor. Those those sounds like they, they sound like lower tier ideas, frankly. I mean, what about tax policy? And uh, you, you know, I mean, cutting consumer demand uh, would lower prices. Now, tax hikes could be an option there to lower consumer demand. Is that something that you would consider? Well, not only is a tax hike not feasible, uh, it's not appropriate right now when we're facing uh, record levels of inflation that's hurting everyday Arizonans. Okay, you say that the uh, tax hike, uh, your quote is, it's not on the table. What is your tax policy? Uh, we have a, a very stable tax environment in the state right now that is bringing in record revenue. Uh, and that's evidenced by the historic investments the legislature has been able to make this last year in things like water infrastructure and uh, public education. Uh, we should not be talking about raising taxes on Arizonans when they are struggling with inflation right now. Should we be talking about lowering taxes? Well, a, a lower tax was just uh, it, uh, was passed uh in the 21 session, and it will go into effect in January. Right, but should we talk about continuing to lower taxes? I mean, your opponent says she wants to get the income tax close to zero as possible. Sounds like what the current governor has been saying for the mm -hmm. past eight years, but the idea of getting the income tax, either eliminating it or getting it as close to zero as possible, something you'd go for? I think we need to look at all the options that are gonna help Arizonans and also allow us to continue to provide the services that Arizonans need from their government and make sure that we are con being able to continue to grow as a state. But is that so that would be an option then? We should look at all the options, absolutely. Um, as far as the budget is concerned, um, did, would you have voted for the last budget if you were still in the legislature? I think the last budget was the first bipartisan budget I've seen in years. Uh, during my time in the legislature, the eight years I was there, we didn't have a bipartisan budget. Uh, and and I don't think I think the budgets that were passed under my time there fell far short of meeting the needs of Arizonans. And this budget was a good budget. And it shows what you can do when folks are willing to put partisan differences aside and work together. And it's the kind of uh, thing I hope to be able to work on as governor. Has enough been done, though, to uh, get money back into funding things that were cut drastically during the recession? Uh, I think education is a good example here, and uh, certainly the billion new dollars to our public schools uh, is critical funding. Uh, the problem we're facing now is that the legislature refuses to repeal the aggregate expenditure limit, and so schools right now are in limbo because they can't budget this billion new dollars that was appropriated to them. Let's stick with education here. Why is there a teacher shortage in Arizona, and what would you do to recruit and retain teachers? We have a crisis in education in Arizona because our leaders have failed to invest in our children. And uh, it's hurting our children, it's hurting our families, it is shortchanging the future of our state. Uh, we need to invest more dollars into the classroom to keep teachers. My prepared Arizona plan proposes an average, uh, a teacher increase to get to the national average, which is an average of $14,000 a teacher. Uh, that's an important place to start. My two sisters are both public education teachers, so I hear firsthand from them every day the struggles that teachers are facing in the classroom. 
uh, my little sister decided this year not to sign a new contract uh, because of the, of the challenges that, that they face in the classroom. What are those challenges? Your, your sister in particular, what is she saying? Because we've heard people say it's discipline, we've heard people say it's pay, um, a lack of recognition and respect. What are you hearing? I think it's a, it's a combination of a lot of factors. Pay is certainly part of it, but that lack of recognition and respect that you mentioned is really important. Uh, we are seeing so much division right now uh, in in our political discourse, and uh, education is is one of those places. And teachers have all of a sudden become vilified, and we are talking about banning books instead of how we can support our teachers so that they can do their job to educate our kids. Um, as far as um, education is concerned and divisive nature mm -hmm. of education, would you have signed the expanded voucher bill? I would have not signed that bill. And I'll tell you, uh, the first ESA bill was passed when I was a freshman in the legislature. I didn't support it then because I knew that it would lead to continued expansion till we got to this point. Uh, this voucher system that we are under now doesn't provide real choice and educational opportunity for most families. Uh, it diverts resources from our public schools and provides a subsidy for already wealthy children whose parents could already afford private education for them. It's not the right way to ensure that every student in our state has access to quality education. Uh, but the governor says, the current governor says that kids are trapped in failing schools. It's his quote, it's time to free these families. Does he have a point? There are always gonna be kids who are stuck in these schools. And until we invest in those schools and make sure that every student, no matter where they live, gets quality public education, we're gonna have the same issue. This voucher system does not fix that at all. As far as the education system and getting a quality education, uh, how do you close the achievement gap in Arizona? Well, it goes back to investing in our public schools and making sure that every student has access to that neighborhood school, a performing school. Uh, and we have to start by investing in early childhood education. My plan does that, and it starts in the neighborhoods that need it the most, where there are those achievement gaps, so that we're getting students off to the right start, so that they're not falling behind, uh, and, that, and that they're successful, that they're reading by third grade, that they're continuing to keep up in the classroom and attaining graduation. What about accountability? How do you make sure that the money being spent is being spent correctly? Well, I think that uh, public, public schools in Arizona have some of the highest accountability standards. And when you look at the system we have in place, uh, charter schools don't have to meet many of those same accountability standards. And we certainly don't have accountability uh, in whatever education systems these voucher dollars are going to. And that's where we need to focus on strengthening accountability. Your opponent once supported cameras in the classroom 24-7. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that idea? I think it's a terrible idea and it does nothing to address the struggles that our students and families and teachers are facing in the classroom every single day. Uh, in fact, it could lead to uh, very dangerous things like stalkers uh, spying on kids in the classroom. Let's move on to abortion here. Um, it, it's very confusing right now. The landscape is very yeah. confusing regarding which law applies and what's being you know, uh, looked at by the courts. 15-week ban mm -hmm. right now is uh, de facto. Would you support that law? Uh, no, I did not support that law when it was passed and signed by the governor. Uh, it is an extreme ban and also includes no exceptions for rape or incest. Uh, this is the kind of ban that creates uh, confusion and chaos for people that need this health care and that could potentially put women's lives at risk. And I just to expand on that, the, the other law that is potentially going to be in effect, the Civil War era ban that criminalizes all abortion, uh, my opponent has said that that's a great law. And she's called women who seek abortion executioners and murderers. I have a, a 20 year old daughter uh, and in 2022, she has less rights than I did 50 years ago. The, uh, your opponent though has recently said that her views apparently have changed. She now wants abortion to be rare, um, but not illegal. What do you make of that? Uh, I think that she walked that back. I think that she doubled down on her uh, desire to criminalize all abortion. As far as any kind of uh, any kind of limit, any kind of uh, limit for abortion, 
Where, where do you go? F 15 weeks? Do you, uh, what do you do? Where do you go? Abortion is health care, and it is health care should be left to medical providers who have the expertise. And a, a decision to have abortion should be between a woman and her doctor. Does that equate to no limits? Look, there is no one size fits all limit that's going to address really extreme circumstances. And um, this idea that there's rampant late term abortion is just false. Late term abortion is incredibly, incredibly rare. And when that happens, it is often devastating to a woman and her family. They have a nursery, they have a name picked out for the baby. They're having this conversation because something has gone terribly wrong. And doctors need the ability to provide the care that their patients need in those very difficult and rare and extreme circumstances. So it sounds like that, that, that the answer is no limits. Do you think Arizonans want to see no limits as far as abortion is concerned? What I know that is that right now, Arizonans don't support the 15-week ban and they support access to safe and legal abortion. And that's the conversation that we should be having. How do we make abortion legal and safe and allow doctors to provide the care that they need to provide to their patients instead of being on the phone with their lawyers to find out if they're gonna be arrested for it. Um, does Arizona have an immigration crisis at the border? Well, Arizona as a border state has borne the brunt of decades of inaction from our leaders in Washington on immigration. Uh, absolutely nobody wants to see criminals and drugs trafficked across the border and we need the Biden administration, frankly, to do more about border security. Uh, and we need comprehensive immigration reform that will ex address some of the crisis that we're seeing. Uh, but this is not new. This is a result of decades of inaction. Uh, your opponent has proclaimed this an invasion, mm -hmm. and she wants to uh, join a compact with other states uh, to apply pressure to defend the border mm -hmm. um, in a, in a well, constitutional way that mm -hmm. she can explain far better than I can. <laughs> but, I mean, it, that's a different idea. Is that something we should look at? Um, no. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I want to say that my plan for border security has been endorsed by two border sheriffs uh, because it's a feasible plan that will actually address the issues that they're seeing in their communities and provide resources to, uh, to, to provide meaningful relief and help them keep their communities safe. Carrie Lake's plan, I, I hate to call it a plan, it's not really a plan, uh, uh, is constitutionally dubious and would do nothing to secure the border. She has said that on day one of her administration, she will declare uh, an invasion on day one. So that's, I don't know what she's talking about, this compact, whatever, but that is not, you, she's gonna declare an invasion on day one. Does nothing to secure the border, would bring untold levels of chaos into our state. How would you define a secure border? Uh, well, certainly uh, the progress on the wall is encouraging. I think the Biden administration recently made uh, some investments in strengthening portions and filling in gaps. Uh, and there are areas on the border that can't be walled. Uh, and, and we know that. And so there's technology and other surveillance available to secure those areas. But we need more resources in terms of human resources, uh, because, you know, I sat in a Border Patrol office and watched uh, people uh, smuggling drugs across the border. Um, and they told me, they said, we are, we are outgunned by their technology. We need more technology and they need more people. It, it sounds as if you do support the wall at the border? Uh, I think that, that the wall is a very symbolic uh, gesture. And people like it because they can see it and feel it and touch it. Um, it's not the only answer because there are places that can't be walled and there's technology that can help address those gaps. So you wouldn't work, uh, try to dismantle any part of the wall or get rid of it or slow down construction where it could be constructed? I don't think that's up to me. It's up to, it's, the, the wall is on federal land uh, and I think it's more important to work uh, in cooperation to address the needs of our state um, and that's what I would do. Yeah, I guess promote it more than actually mm -hmm. do something as far as legislation was concerned. But you would promote the idea of continuing with the wall. Uh, I would support uh, the federal government's uh, progress uh, on securing the border, whether La that's with the wall or personnel or 
uh, cameras and other technology. Would you consider uh, continue, I should say, Governor Ducey's border strike force? Uh, I think that if the border strike force uh, is effective, then yes, and I think there's been uh, dubious information about whether or not it is. Uh, I think it's um, uh, important to make sure that uh, state law enforcement is working in cooperation with local law enforcement. And when I talk to local leaders, I'm hearing that that's not the case, uh, that they don't get intelligence, that they, there's not coordination. And I think that's critical to addressing these issues at the border. Um, your opponent has said that uh, it is disqualifying, disqualifying for a gubernatorial candidate not to declare the 2020 election <laughs> stolen. How do you res this was actually during the primary, yeah. but I, think, I imagine the sentiment still holds. How do you respond to that? I would respond that it is disqualifying for her to say that it was uh, and to be running on that as her entire platform. She has made it her platform to dismantle our democracy and overturn the will of the voters for the former president that she's that she is more beholden to than the people of Arizona. Why do you think there are so many people who question the results? Because political leaders like Carrie Lake continue to mislead them. Uh, she is not running for the people of Arizona. She's running for herself and for the former president. And when people like her questioned the results of the 2020 election and tried to overturn them, we stood firm because there is no evidence of anything she or anyone else says about the 2020 election being stolen. That being said, how do you instill confidence in the election system when so many people, regardless of how they got the information, who gave them the information, they still believe there's a problem? What do you do? They believe there's a problem because people like Carrie Lake keep lying about it. And so I'm going to keep doing what I've done since 2020, and that is tell the truth and continue to lead and ensure that we are administering our elections with integrity, because we are. And uh, we're going to continue to push back on the lies, and we're going to continue to make sure that voters have the accurate information, both about how to participate in the process and countering the lies that continue to be told. We've got to talk about water here. Mm -hmm. The pace of growth in Arizona, Does do we have enough water to meet that pace of growth? And if not, how do you handle that? What do you do? Uh, we certainly are at a point of crisis, and uh, we need to take uh, drastic action to address that. Uh, and that means uh, making sure that when we are planning for future growth, that we are actually planning, that it is strategic, and that we have the resources to meet those, meet the demand. Uh, the, the legislature just made a billion dollar investment in water infrastructure. Uh, that's an important first step, but it's going to cost a lot more than a million dollars, a billion dollars. Uh, uh, the governor's plan relies heavily on desalination. Uh, that's also an important tool, but we are at least a decade away from that being a reality. And so that is not an immediate response. We need things that are more immediate and address uh, the the issue more, um, much more more uh, immediately. Uh, and we can do that with um, improved technology around recycling water, um, investing in conservation projects, which also um, this, the, the legislature and governor's plan does, uh, but we need to do more. Colorado River water. I mean, uh, we're still, we've got a next compact coming up. We just finished talking about a previous one. We've got yeah. another one coming up, and we're finding out the Colorado River water levels, uh, they're sinking, and they're sinking fast. Yeah. I mean, what do you do in terms of collaboration and cooperation mm -hmm. with the lower basin states mm -hmm. to ensure Arizona has its proper supply of water, Colorado River water? Yes, uh, that is absolutely a critical issue, and um, and I don't think that collaboration has been happening. Uh, it's it's a, a lot of competition, and we have to work together because we're in this together, and uh, and we need a leader who is willing to go to the table and fight for Arizona's interests. Uh, and make sure that we're working together on that. We're running out of time here, but I did want to mention health concerns. Yeah. Uh, the current governor, did he handle the pandemic correctly? I think there's a lot of armchair quarterbacking that can be done. I think it's important for the next governor to come in and really talk with um, with leaders across the state about what we did well and what we need to do better. Uh, and be prepared uh, in case, you know, something like this happens again. Uh, I think that's really critical. 
Um, I think that uh, when you're in a crisis as a leader, you don't get to choose what crisis you're in, um, and you have to take decisive action. And uh, people are going to question that. Uh, we have to work together in the best interests of the state, and that's what I'll do as governor. Would you have used, though, executive powers in a similar fashion? I think executive uh, powers are an important tool for a governor leading through a crisis. I, I'm not going to speak to a hypothetical, but I think um, in making executive orders, uh, as was done it, during the pandemic, um, they need to be done judiciously and fairly um, and not singling out um, different industries in different ways, but that there's a level playing field and uh, most importantly, that we're keeping not only Arizonans safe, but allowing the economy to continue. Last question here, circling back around. Um, this is not a debate. Unfortunately, it's not a debate. Um, your opponent has called you a coward for not debating. Let's wrap this up with your response to her claims that you are simply afraid to face her one on one. I'm not afraid to face Carrie Lake. What I am concerned about is the embarrassment that occurred during the, the gubernatorial, the GOP gubernatorial debate. Uh, and I am not going to be a part of her spectacle. Uh, because this right now, this here, is a much better opportunity for voters to hear straight from me where I stand on the issues. Um, people who say that I should debate her because that's, they want to see us talk about the issues, she had an opportunity to come here and have the same conversation with you, and she turned it down. Uh, but I'm making my case to the voters right now about uh, my ability to lead this state, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity. Katie Hobbs, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.